And with that, I'll introduce our first group here. Alors, en premier, on a la session « Joie, queer et résilience, une étude self-film participative avec des jeunes LGBTQ+, au Québec ». Et je vous présente Amy Ranim, qui est étudiée en maîtrise de sciences politiques et qui est agent de recherche au laboratoire Collab à l'École de santé publique. Et elle coordonne le programme Jeunes chercheurs queer, un programme participatif et communautaire. Il est destiné aux jeunes 18 à 29 ans de la communauté de SLGBTQIA+, intéressés par le monde de la recherche. Puis Olivier Ferlat, qui est professeur adjoint à l'École de santé publique de l'Université de Montréal et chercheur régulier au Centre de recherche en santé publique. Ses travaux de recherche sont axés sur les relations entre la stigmatisation, la consommation de substances et la santé mentale chez les com communautés de SLGBTQIA+. Ses travaux scientifiques sont basés sur plusieurs méthodologies, qualitatives, quantitatives, méthodes artistiques, approches mixtes, et sont motivés par un intérêt particulier pour l'engagement communautaire et la participation des personnes touchées par les inégalités en santé en tant que partenaire de recherche. Monsieur Ferlat est le directeur Collab, un laboratoire de recherche communautaire et collaboratif sur la santé mentale des personnes de SLGBTQIA+. Alors, bienvenue sur scène, Olivier et Amy. Bonjour, merci beaucoup là, de nous recevoir. Je trouve, je trouve ça toujours malaisant quand tu es assis et quelqu'un lit euh, ta biographie, euh, même si c'est toi qui l'as écrit. Euh, alors aujourd'hui, on est ici pour vous parler de résilience. Avant de faire notre présentation, on veut juste reconnaître qu'on a voyagé de Jojage, qui est le euh, territoire ancestral, euh, un territoire ancestral autochtone, et que c'est le territoire dont la nation Kaninkaga est la euh, gardienne des terres, puis qu'aujourd'hui, on se retrouve aussi euh, en territoire autochtone non cédé, euh, qui appartient aux nations euh, Squamish, Musqueam et tsleil Je pense que c'est important de reconnaître euh, la force et la résilience aussi euh, des peuples autochtones euh, au Canada. Alors, aujourd'hui, on va vous parler d'un projet euh, sur euh, la résilience euh, des jeunes des communautés. C'est un projet de recherche qu'on a fait avec, en partenariat avec euh, les jeunes du programme Jeunes chercheurs queer. Euh, les jeunes chercheurs queer, c'est l'adaptation montréalaise et francophone du programme Investigators, qui est un programme du CBRC. C'est un programme de renforcement euh, des capacités des jeunes en recherche. Donc, on travaille avec des jeunes de 18 à 29 ans qui sont intéressés, qui veulent apprendre la recherche. Et on travaille avec eux sur des projets de recherche là, vraiment concrets. Le programme existe euh, à Montréal depuis 2021. Et il est inséré dans mon laboratoire de recherche qui s'appelle Collab, qui est un laboratoire qui veut faire de la recherche participative et communautaire sur les enjeux de santé mentale et consommation de substances avec les communautés. Je vous invite à aller voir euh, notre euh, site web collab.ca si vous voulez plus d'informations sur nos activités. Donc, le projet qu'on va parler aujourd'hui, c'est un projet qui s'appelle « Je prends ma place », qui s'intéressait à comprendre la résilience et la force des jeunes euh, la, des communautés en lien avec la santé mentale. Donc, quand on, 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 on a travaillé avec les jeunes chercheurs queer euh, à partir de l'année 2022-2023, et on a fait un projet qui mobilise euh, une approche de méthodologie qui s'appelle le « self-filming », donc euh, qui est la construction des mots euh, « cell phone » et « euh, film, donc qui consiste à faire produire une vidéo à avec un téléphone cellulaire par euh, des participants. Euh, donc, euh, les vidéos d'environ 1 minute 30, afin qu'ils puissent partager euh, leur expérience et euh, leur perspective sur un sujet donné. Donc, dans le contexte de ce projet-là, on a travaillé avec les jeunes chercheurs queer pour recruter d'autres jeunes qui ont participé à trois ateliers qui étaient animés par les jeunes chercheurs queer. Le premier atelier, c'était un peu pour se rencontrer puis aussi développer un storyboard. Il y avait un deuxième atelier où on révisait les storyboards et on parlait de différents euh, trucs et astuces pour faire une vidéo là, convaincante, là, comment filmer, euh, puis aussi parler d'enjeux éthiques. Euh, puis le troisième euh, atelier était un atelier où les jeunes amenaient leurs vidéos et euh, discutaient là, des, des différents thèmes qui étaient dans les vidéos. Puis on parlait un peu de la signification là, des vidéos sur euh, la résilience et la santé mentale. Donc, euh, à travers ces ateliers-là, il y a eu 11 self-films qui ont été produits par les jeunes. Et en ce moment, on travaille avec les jeunes chercheurs queer, justement, pour analyser euh, les données. Et on va vous en parler un peu, hein, tout en, en, en mettant un, un, l'accent sur le fait qu'on est encore en train d'analyser les données. Donc, tout le travail est encore préliminaire. Donc, je vais laisser Amy euh, prendre le relais. 
Oui, donc je vais maintenant vous inviter à regarder la vidéo de Mar. Mar est une personne non binaire de euh, 24 ans et son seul film s'intitule « Ce qui me donne de la résilience dans ma vie fucking queer ». Ce qui m'a donné de la résilience dans ma vie vraiment fucking queer. Pour moi, la résilience est l'ensemble des choses que je veux faire et qui m'apporte de la confiance et de la régénération. C'est aussi les choses que je dois parfois me motiver à faire et qui m'apportent également de la force. Pour moi, la résilience consiste à voir mon thérapeute comme le jour où je n'ai pas dans le vie de parler de mes sentiments. C'est aussi de me motiver à lire les livres de la bibliothèque trop nombreux et qui sont en retard et je suis en train de parcourir lentement avant de les renvoyer en compagnie par le lettre plus longue d'excuses du monde. C'est de me forcer à approcher des amis et de faire les plans. Et le moment où je me souviens que cette personne probablement ne me déteste pas et que Yel est probablement heureuse de passer de temps avec moi. La résilience, ce sont les plans que je fais avec mes amis et les soirées de jeux de société gay que nous avons. La résilience, c'est de me forcer à aller courir sachant que je me sentirai bien après et que je recevrai l'inévitable dose de sérotonine après l'avoir fait. La résilience, c'est me rappeler de prendre soin de l'espace qui m'entoure aussi et rendre ces choses aussi plus faciles que possible pour moi. La résilience, c'est courir avec les éclats d'énergie neurodivergente que j'ai pour accomplir les tâches, qu'il s'agisse d'un coup d'inspiration pour commencer une peinture qui finit par me prendre six heures ou de me rappeler soudainement que j'ai ce projet que je voulais réaliser depuis longtemps et de l'exécuter. Courir avec les flux et les reflux d'énergie que j'ai quand je les ai. Créer surtout quand j'ai l'inspiration et poursuivre en où commencer même si je crains que cela ne se passe bien ou que je n'ai pas de la compétence nécessaire pour réaliser ma vision. C'est de la résilience. Toutes ces choses me donnent de la résilience. L'important n'est pas qu'elle soit facile, mais que la plupart des choses qui me donnent le plus de résilience sont extrêmement difficiles. Ce qui explique pourquoi le fait de m'appuyer sur ma communauté et les gens qui m'entourent, c'est également un élément clé de ma résilience. En fait de compte, ma résilience ne provient pas d'une seule source, mais que je sais qu'elle est tous autour de moi, à ma portée et aussi en moi. Être queer, c'est résilient. Être créatif, c'est de la résilience. Atteindre ses objectifs chaque jour, c'est de la résilience. Ceci sont juste quelques exemples de ce qui me donne de la résilience dans ma vie. Vraiment fucking queer. Ok. Euh, désolé pour la, la vidéo qui a eu un peu de mal, vous n'avez pas pu voir la suite. Mais euh, ce qu'on observe là, euh, dans le self-film de Mars, c'est euh, beaucoup la socialisation queer, le besoin d'être entouré de ses amis, de ses communautés, euh, de faire de l'exercice physique aussi. On voit Mars courir, euh, l'art, donc la peinture et la menuiserie que fait Mars lui provoque beaucoup de, de joie de, de vivre. Ses soins aussi d'affirmation de genre. Il y a une scène où on voit Mars qui prend une shot de testostérone. Donc c'est des thèmes qu'on a retrouvés beaucoup dans les différents self-films de nos participants participantes. Et ici, si on regarde les citations de Mar, donc ces citations, elles proviennent du focus group euh, dont Mar a fait partie, donc l'atelier 3 du projet Selfim. Euh, Mar mentionne notamment que euh, la résilience pour Yel, c'est se motiver à faire et à finir des choses. C'est de faire des plans avec ses amis malgré son anxiété sociale. Euh, c'est aussi pour Yel euh, être queer, sa force d'être queer, sa résilience d'être queer. C'est aussi d'avoir accès à sa communauté trans et sa communauté queer. Donc, on va maintenant essayer de regarder le self-film de Cove, ce qui s'appelle « Presser sans pression ». Donc Cove, c'est une personne de 20 ans qui est non-binaire. Um, can we play? Je t'ai rencontré sur la poitrine d'un de mes artistes préférés, puis dès que j'en ai eu la chance, ben, je t'ai essayé. J'ai vite compris comment tu changes des vies, comment tu sauves des vies. Sans risque de fracture thoracique ou de restriction, tu m'obliges à prendre soin de moi, à prendre mon temps. C'est pas toujours facile, mais on s'adapte. Je sais que ton soutien est toujours là au besoin. Comme je suis une personne pressée de vivre, c'est une pression en moins.
donc, ce sales team, dans l'équipe, on l'a renommé euh, la shot de bonheur, parce que c'est juste du bonheur complet pendant une minute. On l'a vraiment beaucoup apprécié. Euh, ce qu'on observe dans le self-team de Cove, c'est beaucoup euh, la, la joie de vivre, la joie queer. Euh, on voit des moments de self-care, on voit des moments où euh, Cove se maquille, prend soin de Yel. Euh, on voit des moments où aussi elle fait des activités avec ses familles, euh, à l'extérieur, euh, à la montagne, avec ses amis aussi. Euh, on comprend aussi que le fait d'utiliser le binding tape, qui est un outil d'affirmation de genre, lui provoque beaucoup de bien, euh, lui fait du bien à son corps. Euh, ça lui permet d'être à, à l'écoute de Yel et de son corps. Donc, dans son focus group, euh, Coves mentionnait le fait que son message explicite, c'était que n'importe quel soin ou produit d'affirmation de genre peut procurer de la joie de vivre. Et elle mentionne également euh, un bienfait psychologique de la méthodologie, le fait que euh, Coves est allé rechercher des souvenirs qui lui font du bien, des images qui lui font du bien, euh, ça, ça, ça l'a mis dans une introspection euh, personnelle, puis ça lui a provoqué beaucoup de bonheur. Aussi le fait d'échanger avec euh, d'autres jeunes de sa communauté sur ces moments de, de bonheur, ça lui a fait du bien. Donc c'est quelque chose qu'on a beaucoup entendu euh, dans nos ateliers, le fait que la méthodologie qui est faite par et pour provoque énormément de bien pour les participants participantes, ça leur permet d'être plus à l'aise. Euh, aussi, un des avantages de la méthodologie self-team, c'est le fait qu'on puisse ouvrir des discussions et partager les self-team, euh, partager en fait les résultats de la recherche de façon euh, originale, de façon intéressante. Donc on a organisé une euh, projection au cinéma moderne à Montréal euh, pour célébrer les joies queer. Donc on, avait, euh, on a loué le cinéma, les personnes euh, pouvaient venir euh, gratuitement, il n'y avait pas besoin d'invitation, l'événement était euh, ouvert à tous. Euh, on avait aussi offert le pop-corn à tout le monde, donc ça rendait les personnes heureuses. heureuses. Euh, il y a une trentaine de personnes qui se sont déplacées, donc tant des personnes de nos communautés que des alliés, aussi des professionnels de la santé, des professeurs, des universitaires, etc. Euh, on avait donné la possibilité aux jeunes chercheurs queer donc, qui ont animé les discussions et aussi aux participants participantes de prendre la parole sur leur expérience en lien avec la recherche. Euh, donc il y a eu beaucoup de positivité euh, qui, qui, euh, qui a émergé. Euh, aussi, à la fin de la projection, on avait ouvert une discussion plus large sur euh, la résilience, la santé mentale, la résilience communautaire, le, le bien-être de nos communautés, etc. Donc ça a donné l'occasion de tout le monde de parler ensemble, puis d'apporter de, de, un peu de joie dans un, un contexte actuellement politique euh, très violent pour nous. Donc pour conclure, euh, l'animation des ateliers par d'autres euh, jeunes de la communauté de S LGBTQIA+, ça a permis aux participants et participantes de s'adonner à une introspection personnelle et collective, notamment, euh, on le voit avec euh, les... Euh où en fait les personnes pouvaient euh, mettre de l'avant leur force et leur expérience positive. Donc on l'a vu avec les self-films de Coves et Mar, euh, mais aussi les self-films deviennent des représentations positives et faciles à diffuser, qui mettent en lumière les résiliences des jeunes de la communauté euh, LGBTQ+. Donc on aimerait remercier nos bailleurs de fonds, euh, qui sont l'Agence de santé publique pour le programme Jeunes Chercheurs Queer, mais aussi le réseau euh, de recherche en santé des populations du Québec pour le projet Selfim. Et aussi on aimerait remercier évidemment les participants participantes du, projet, euh, je, du programme Jeunes Chercheurs Queer et du projet Je prends ma place. Euh, et euh, si ça vous intéresse de regarder les autres Selfim du projet, vous pouvez scanner le QR code, ils sont tous disponibles sur YouTube. Merci. Yeah, we can keep the QR code up as I present the next speaker. Merci, Amy et Olivier. Up next, we have Tiffany Brown, who will be sharing ACB 2SLGBTQ plus youth, journey mapping to liberation. And Tiffany Brown is the operations director at the, Rib at the Ribbon Rouge Foundation and has been serving the organization for just over a year. She has over 10 years of experience working in the Jamaican Foreign Service and recently completed a settlement studies diploma program in Canada where she gained the unique knowledge and skills to assist all immigrants and newcomers when they are settling in Canada. Tiffany is currently lead on the journey mapping project that focuses on the lived experiences of the African, Caribbean and Black 2SLGBTQ plus community in Canada as they access services and is collaboratively working with a team of experts on the creation of a curriculum that will sensitize service providers to the needs of the ACB 2SLGBTQ plus community. Welcome, Tiffany. Hello. Very nervous. Um, 
So again, my name is Tiffany. Good morning, everyone. I am Operations Director at Ribbon Rouge Foundation, and I'm also lead on the Journey Mapping Project. And so today I'll be presenting for you the ACB 2SLGTQ plus youth journey, journeying to liberation. So I'll begin by just telling you a little bit about Ribbon Rouge. Um, Ribbon Rouge is a grassroots, so we're really a community level organization. Um, we're not for profit, and we're based in Alberta, in Edmonton. Um, we highly value community involvement, contribution, and participation. Our goal is to achieve health equity and social justice for African, Caribbean, and black, or as we say, ACB individuals, and we do so through the arts. Not everyone may be familiar with the term ACB, um, and so I'd like to express why we say in ACB instead of black. Well, through our research and our shared experiences, we've learned that it's very important to recognize that there is a lot of diversity within the black community. The umbrella term black to represent all ACB people is just not sufficient. The lived and living experiences of ACB individuals are not the same. Therefore, we acknowledge that there, there cannot be a blanket solution to the various barriers and issues that are faced by each group within the ACB community. And just to put that into perspective, if you have two persons who are from the continent of Africa, but two separate countries, their experiences will be very different. It could be language, it could be religion, it could be cultural. So their experiences will be very different. Therefore, um, the barriers and issues they face will be different and so their solutions will have to be tailored. The work we do at Ribbon Rouge Foundation is mainly through research and collection of data that seeks to improve impacts on ACB individuals along with or impacted by HIV. We make recommendations for policies, facilitate culture appropriate training through service providers, and we advocate against systemic racism. While we're mandated to produce reports and other outcomes to our funders, much of our data mobilization is shared at the community level through various art forms such as interactive theater, visual art, and poetry. And I'd also like to invite everyone, if you have a moment, when you have a moment, to visit our website, ribbonrouge.com, where we've actually begun mobilizing in a different way through a dashboard. We did a project with some students at the University of Alberta looking at how ACB people in Alberta um, managed through the pandemic, through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have a dashboard that's very interactive. So I invite you all to visit um, when you have a little time. So the aim of this journey mapping project um, is to highlight the experiences of ACB 2S LGBTQI plus individuals when they've accessed services and their interactions with different service systems in Alberta. This was done in order to help improve the supports that are available. The systems that participants interacted with were systems associated with mental health, substance abuse, sexually transmitted bloodborne infections, also known as STBBIs, and criminal justice. Our goal is to improve the outcomes for ACB 2S LGBTQI plus youth when accessing these services by increasing cultural awareness and encouraging cultural humility among service providers via a training course that brings awareness to how culture and race influence identities of ACB 2S LGBTQI plus youth. The training course will help to fill in gaps that currently exist so that these youths can have a better experience when accessing services, and in turn, this will lead to better outcomes. So for this project, we really tried to include participants from across the different ACB communities who interacted with the different systems. Here we have just a snippet of some of the demographics of who our participants were. In the first graph, we see that of the 24 participants, 17% of, well, in the first graph, we see that of the 24 participants with whom interviews were conducted, 17% of the participants were Nigerian, while 12% identified as black Canadians. However, 53% did not state their ethnic or cultural identity. That in itself is quite telling. Next, we can take a look at the gender identities represented. This demographic gave a little bit of a clearer picture of who participated among the part, of who participated. Among the participants, there were almost 30% who identified as non-binary, while 25% identified as women and 24% as men. 
18% of participants were transgender, and 6% identified as gender fluid. With regards to interacting with systems, in the third graph, we see that the highest frequency was for mental health services, followed by services for substance abuse and then services for STBBIs and criminal justice. We also learned from the data that 60% of the participants accessed two of the systems, 20% accessed three systems, and 20% accessed only one of the systems mentioned. So some of the major issues arising from the participants during their interviews were discrimination and racism, misinformation, no long-term plan developed, and that therapy was very westernized. This left participants not willing to seek additional services or assistance as they felt it was pointless. Additionally, six focus groups were conducted. The six focus groups consisted of service providers that often served ACB 2S LGBTQI plus youth. Common issues that arose from these discussions were language and cultural barriers, lack of cultural appro culturally appropriate resources, lack of cultural and racial representation, and lack in inclusivity. Through these discussions, we also learned that service providers often felt unprepared, undertrained, and inadequate to offer effective services or care. So, to create a training course that could provide training to provide culturally sensitive care, a team of experts from among service providers in Alberta was formed to help build this curriculum. The experts represented organizations that worked directly with ACB 2S LGBTQI plus individuals. The team looked at the recurring themes that arose from the interviews and focus groups. As a result, the themes were culturally appropriate care, intersectionality, gender and sexual orientations across cultures, racial and cultural discrimination, and cultural influence on wellness. These were selected based on how best most of the issues being faced by ACB to us LGBTQI plus youth could be, could be addressed. The course consists of theory and videos and includes multiple choice assessments and reflection questions. It will be available in English and French. Service, will, service, providers, will, for service providers will be able to access the training course via our website, ribbonrouge.com. The curriculum is about 95% complete and will be handed over to the developer very soon. We're hoping to pilot the course before the end of January, and as such, we're seeking, to vol we're seeking volunteers to pilot the training course. So this is an open invitation to any organization that may serve ACB to us LGBTQI plus youth um, to help us with this pilot. And if you're interested, um, you can reach me at tiffany at ribbonrouge.com or admin at ribbonrouge.com for more information. And so I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge our funders and our partners, Public Health Agency of Canada, Edmonton Community Foundation, Northwest College, Firefly Institute for Gender and Sexual Diversity, formerly known as ISMIS, Institute of Sexual Minority Studies and Services, Alberta Black Therapist Network, Francophone Albertine Priel, and End of the Road Foundation. So I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And again, if you're interested in supporting the pilot of this training course, please reach out to us at the emails on the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you to our first two presentations. At this time, I'll ask the second half of our session to come forward and take a seat at the table here. And while that's happening, I'd like to say a little about this next group because there isn't a bio here but they're a pretty deadly bunch and all I can say too is I have a tremendous amount of respect for these folks and all of the work that they do and being able to work beside them within the Two-Spirit program is is really a, an honor so I'd like to welcome from Two-Spirits in Motion Society Kiara Monroe, Willow Bearhead and Owen Petit as they present Two-Spirit Youth are the future seven generations. Thank you, Lane. We're very grateful to work alongside you in our community. And you do amazing work, so. Hi everyone, we'd like to acknowledge that we are on unceded territory of uh, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh. 
Um, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Willow Bearhead. I am from Paul First Nation, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, also Alberta. Um, I am Nakota Cree and Dene, and I am also um, uses the, uh, he, him pronouns. Sorry, I'm just still learning how to use this. <laughs> um, so I am currently um, registered in uh, the First Nations University, and I am taking my second year of Indigenous social work. I work part-time with Two Sims as a co-national post-secondary youth coordinator. Um, so a lot of my work is through online, and I work alongside Kiara Monroe. Um, hello, my name is Kira, and I am on. I am from Treaty Four Territory, Yellow Quill First Nations, and I reside on Treaty Six Territory. Um, I am in my fourth year of Indigenous Social Work at First Nations University and will graduate with my Reconciliation Studies Certificate. I am um, co-founder of J Dreamers. It's a new organization that we're starting up for queer kids that aged out of the system and have no support or community. And uh, I sit on the Two-Spirit Inclusivity Group at my university, and I sit on uh, Two-Spirit Alliance of Saskatchewan. It's a nonprofit in um, Saskatchewan. So my role at Two Sims is the co-national post-secondary youth coordinator. We make social media posts, creating an online community and safe spaces for Two-Spirit and DigiQueer and 2SLGBTQ plus youth all across Turtle Island, colonially known as Canada. We use a web coder and make sure our Two Sims youth website is up to date, having our podcasts and storytelling projects easily accessible. The storytelling project is an amazing way for Two Spirit youth to have an opportunity to use their voice and share their story so that other Indigenous queer youth do not have to feel alone and can get inspired. We also work with a 10 member youth led council. We meet twice a month and ensure we have elder to open and close our meetings in a good way. The youth coordinators help plan queer and culturally safe events for the youth and the community. Hi everyone, my name is Owen Chester. I'm from Buffalo Narrow, Saskatchewan, Treaty 10. I am Two-Spirit in Motion Society's National Youth Force Core Sterilization Project Coordinator. I am a Two-Spirit digital media creator as well. My project at Two Sims was to organize a land-based gathering that happened in the beginning of October. Two members of our youth council and one of our elders joined us in learning about holistic healing, sweat lodges, crafting, drumming, and more. We find that it is, is important not only to learn, but to learn to teach one another about healing. Um, we also have another member, um, a part of our team as well, but unfortunately they couldn't be with us. But we still like to acknowledge them. So um, we have Angelina Paré. Uh, Paré, sorry. Uh, they use okay. Uh, they use they them pronouns, and they are also Afro Indigenous. They are from the Red River Métis settlement and Colombian heritage. Um, <clears throat> they're a registered member of MMF of Treaty One territory, and they work as the National Youth Council and Podcast Coordinator at Two Sims. And they're also the National Youth Representative at NWAC and the Youth Representative at the BOD at MMVI. <laughs> it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so Angelina's role with us is the admin uh, supports to administrative needs and the Two-Spirit Youth Council and helps coordinate with the Two-Spirit Youth Digital Storytelling Project. Two Spirits Emotion Society is a nonprofit organization combined, combined of 
comprised of entirely Two-Spirit and DigiQueer staff. The Two Sims team brings a wealth of experience and enthusiasm together to support Two-Spirit people, organizations, and communities across Turtle Island. We are the first national 2SLGBTQQIA organization and we work tirelessly to educate and strengthen safe and supportive environments for Two-Spirit people. Our vision and mission is to create, maintain, and strengthen a safe and supportive social environment for Two-Spirit people to feel and be loved, succeed and become empowered to make their own decisions and to find or express their purpose in life. We also aim to create safe spaces where Two-Spirit people are able to express themselves through cultural ways of knowing and being around gender and sexuality and to succeed and be empowered in all areas that are grounded in the medicines that Two-Spirit people carry. Serving as a national sounding board, we work to advance their interests of Two-Spirit people. What is Two-Spirit? Two-Spirit is an umbrella term used by some 2SLGBTQIA plus indigenous people in their communities who fulfill a traditional third gender ceremonial and social role in their cultures. The creation of the term Two-Spirit came to Elder Myra Laramie in a dream. She proposed its use during the third annual Intertribal Native American First Nations Gay and Lesbian American Conference held in Lac du Bonnet in 1990. Mm, I don't know. Nis Monidwag is an Ashinobimowin term to for two spirits. <laughs> so part of two, oh. so part of two Sims is um, we have a youth council. We are comprised. Our it is comprised of ten youth, and some of our youth are with us today. They're, over here, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> um, so our ages for our youth council is um, 18 to 29. And we also, they also um, are part of the decision making of how we are gonna work with our podcasts and our storytelling projects. So they give a lot of input in that and they are kind of the voices to these projects that we have currently. So our storytelling project is an amazing way for us to connect and um, empower and uplift our two-spirit youth voices. Um, so right now we have a storytelling project that's going on we have room for five stories at $200 um, for our Two-Spirit youth to submit their story on whatever they feel um, comfortable. And um, it's an amazing way for our Two-Spirit youth to know that they're not alone and um, they can feel inspired. So it's helping youth create positive relationships and identities for Two-Spirit and Indigiqueer youth across Canada through our website and social media presence. The positive messaging is able to reach youth in remote communities where they may feel isolated. It also aims to create more safe spaces for Two-Spirit youth and allow them to be vulnerable with one another and create comradie and a sense of belonging that it might not have within their homes and communities. So you can check out their storytelling project on our website at www.twospirityouth.com. Um, social media creates a platform where youth can express their gender and sexually diverse identities be visible and have a sense of belonging. In societies where two-spirit people may not have as much representation in mainstream media, this is extremely important. Social media helps our indigenous youth who are isolated in the northern communities have access to safe resources and it allows 2S youth to connect with like-minded people who share similar experiences. They can inspire others and aid in breaking stigma and stereotypes by sharing their experience and stories. Often our youth endure isolation and discrimination. However, thanks to the influence of social media, we can establish connections and create a safe community with Two-Spirit and Indigenous queer kin across Turtle Island. You can find more information on our website, twospirityouth.com or our Instagram page at twospirityouth.
So part of our online presence was to amplify our two-spirited youth voices and also indigiqueer. Um, we wanted to not only amplify, but to just share their stories as well to those who are in secluded nations or secluded communities, so this way they could have a sense of community. So we do that through our online presence and uh, yeah, online presence and platform, and we also strengthen the voices of our indigenous queer youth. Yeah, so we have our Two Spirit podcast. Our Two Spirit Youth and Council, they pick what they want to talk about. Um, so we have three seasons, and currently we there has been 20 completed episodes with more episodes on the way. The podcast was created to promote and ampl amplify Two Spirit Youth voices across Turtle Island as we create more spaces for our two-spirit kin within the digital world. It's honestly super amazing. Um, you can find it on Spotify and um, go find the link in our bio on Instagram or on our website. And yes, scan this code right here. Okay. Um, and yeah, so we have a grand total of 450 downloads and have caught the attention of listeners in Turkey, Australia, and France. Yeah, so a lot of our episodes go from like the history of Two Spirit, like drag, um, anime, just, just all so diverse, so. You can play the, this is a little audiogram, so we make these and post them on our social to give a little blurb of what the podcast is about. No, that's our, that's our other video. It's just like right on the screen there. Okay, if it's not, okay. Um, Two-spirit youth are vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable and experience higher rates of anxiety, mental illness, substance misuse, and suicide because of the oppression and rejection they are often faced with. Recognizing and creating such space and crucial fight and equi equity, inclusion, and social acceptance. There is still a lot of violence against two-spirit people in many places. Safe spaces offer a haven for bullying or abuse and a platform for young people to s seek help and support if they experience harm. Safe spaces for Two-Spirit youth are essential for encouraging positive identity, information, mental health, community, cultural connection, and empowerment. They play a vital role in combating discrimination and prejudice while supporting these individuals' personal growth and well-being. Two-Spirit individuals have historically held significant roles within Indigenous cultures through learning about their cultural background and their the customs of their indigenous communities, they can develop a sense of pride in who they are and a sense of belonging. Yeah, uh, we were supposed to have another slide, um, the importance of community. I think you're in charge of that. So as Owen mentioned too, of um, creating community in the safe space, um, part of our job is to not only value the youth voices, but to just amplify, like I mentioned <laughs> before. Um, but we also wanted to create role models in community as well. We see the need to have more representation in community in indigenous communities as well. There's um, 
not enough um, resources and education around two-spirit identity. So what we are trying to do is to bring awareness to that and also strengthen our youth as well in the process of that. Yeah, so these are just a couple of our youth council member quotes. Um, but after this, we do have a video. So significant obstacles that queer youth frequently encounter include stigma, prejudice, and rejection from friends and family. Two-spirit and digi-queer youth can benefit from allies' emotional support, validation, advocacy, and acceptance, enhancing their mental and emotional health and quality of life. And as we know, um, Indigenous people experience racism in the whole society in general, and so it really helps when we have our allies there and um, speaking up for us. So. These are some things that you can do. And then um, we have a culture camp video that we just did that Owen here actually helped, um, that he, he uh, planned and everything. And it was an amazing experience. And um, so we had this one. And then we have coming up in January a gender and sexual um, safe regalia making for powwow So with our youth council. And, uh, Enjoy our video. Gathering on the land is important to me because it's something that brings people closer together and the healing aspect of gathering on the land is something that people may need in their lives and it's also very educational and it can be brought back with you to wherever you go to share with everyone and help heal the generations that come. because with people who've grown up in urban areas and cities, we rarely have the chance in some places even to visit parks, certainly not to visit areas that our ancestors would have lived in and see how, like, the situations that they would have gone through for us to get here. If we don't have access to the land, it's harder to learn tradition in the way that they were meant to be passed along. Gathering on the land together means we can learn from each other. Sometimes we have different teachings, especially when we're from East or West Coast. Take teachings that resonate with us and maybe teachings that don't really resonate, but that's okay. You know, when we're, we're gathering here, this this these last couple of days and even just like walking up to get here to this hill there's like medicine all, all along this path here mini waka water all along here and it's a reminder of how how much beauty and gifts that inamaka gives us that mother earth gives us All of these experiences together um, you know it wasn't just like the sweat lodge it was the fact that like it was the sweat lodge on this land it wasn't just that we got to make rattles it was that we also got to sing songs with the singers and the drummers so it's kind of all these pieces together um, we got to go to Elder Marjorie's house and spend some time in my first time in like a Métis shanty house like a little shack house and it was just really touching it felt really homey and uh, eating really good food, like it, it was everything together that was so special, like each one thing was beautiful, but having it all together and like being like immersed in that. It's an amazing 
thing when we gather on the land because I think some of these lands haven't seen two spirits gather in a very long time. So it's always a really humbling thing to be a part of, but also I feel immense gratitude that I was able to participate in this. I feel at home. I feel connected. I feel that I'm welcome. I feel like we go through similar experiences. It feels like a community and sometimes it's hard because I don't get a lot of that from home. It was lovely being out here with everybody and spending time around the fire. It reminded me a lot of when I was a kid and we'd go camping, that whole family connection. It's reconnecting to each other as much as to the land. I just wanted to just express my gratitude to Two Sims. The funders and the staff of Two Sims are just like, they're not just staff members, like they're community members and they're people and they're friends. And so I always feel like I'm in a, a healthy, happy space when I'm with everybody and it's a real gift. I wanted to just say thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Kiera, Willow, and Owen. And up next, I'd like to invite Kalisha Clausen, who is the adjunct professor with the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University and a postdoctoral fellow with the University of California, San Diego Center on Gender Equity and Health and Jem Y. Lee, who is a recent graduate of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at SFU and a youth research associate with the Reimagine team. On their short presentation, nobody has written the book about what non-binary people should put forward in relationships, exploring gender equity in relationships of queer, trans, and non-monogamous young women and non-binary youth in British Columbia. Hello everyone, my name is Jem Yellen Lee, my pronouns are they, them, and this is Dr. Kalisha Clausen with she, her pronouns. Today we are presenting the findings from our paper called Nobody Has Written the Book About What Non-Binary People Should Put Forward in Relationships, Exploring Gender Equity in Relationships of Queer, Trans, and Non-Monogamous Young Women and Non-Binary Youth in British Columbia. Canada. We are presenting on behalf of the Greater Reimagine study and this beautiful team we have on the study. We respectfully acknowledge that we are privileged to work, live, and play on the ancestral and ceded territories of the Coast Salish Nation, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Today, we will be reviewing the background, methods, results, and implications of our paper with you all. Okay, so as a bit of a background, I think we all know that most intimate relationships are formed in adolescence and, and young adulthood for the first time, and that intimate relationships are both, in young adulthood and adolescence, are both a source of stress, so can lead to increased mental health and sexual and reproductive health concerns, but are also a really important source of support. And especially among 2SLGBTQ plus youth relationships can, can be an important buffer against stigma and discrimination. But much of what we know about youth intimate relationships are often framed, especially in the context of research and health, uh, in a risk-based narrative, so focused on STIs, violence, and unintended pregnancies. And while these areas of research are important, uh, there's a real lack of strength-based research that focuses on 2SLGBTQ plus youth relationships. 
Uh, and within the context of relationships in health, we also know that young women and non-binary youth, as well as non-monogamous youth, often get left out of these conversations and how we conceptualize gender equity and relationship equity. And so in order to further relationship programming or healthy relationship programming for all youth, uh, we really need a better understanding and a deeper uh, comprehension of how young queer, trans, and non-monogamous women and non-binary non individuals conceptualize gender-based power dynamics and equity within their relationships. So our study sought to explore this um, by working with young women and, and non-binary youth uh, to understand their experiences of gender equity in their relationships. And this study is embedded within a larger program of research that's really interested in understanding gender and relationship equity uh, and creating more inclusive measures to understand this within research. And this research is framed under a youth engagement approach where we have a really amazing team of youth advisory committee members uh, as well as youth research associates. Um, and these youth research associates were actually the ones that conducted the qualitative interviews that we're gonna present some of the results of from today. Um, and this was done between August and November of last year uh, with 30 youth, uh, 17 to 29, in, in British Columbia. Together as a team, we conducted a reflexive thematic analysis, uh, which really we looked at the data collaboratively um, and got feedback from the youth advisory committee members as well as our youth research associates um, to come up with what were the main themes that came up when people talked about what did gender equity in their relationships mean for them. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Jem to talk about demographics, but just to note that we asked folks in the, in the qualitative interviews uh, open-endedly about their, their demographics, so age, uh, gender, sexual orientation, race, and ethnicity, and, and we worked with the team to kind of figure out how we were gonna present these slides today. We acknowledge that they're not perfect, um, but this was done in a collaborative way as well. Yeah, so this is our, uh, the demographics of our study of 30 participants. As you can see, gender was dominantly equally split um, between folks identifying as women and folks identifying with non-binary gender fluid or gender queer markers, with 6.7% unsure or questioning. We allowed folks to select multiple options in the sexuality demographics portion. Note here that those identifying only as bi and lesbian slash gay are represented here, whereas anyone with one or more of the queer pandemi are in that dominant group of 56.7%. Additionally, we had 53.3% of participants identifying with having trans experience. And for ethnicity, 63.3% of our participations were white with 36.7% of racialized participants whom identified with the following ethnicities listed here. We heard from youth in various locations across BC with the majority 14 participants from lower mainland. And the age range for our study was youth aged 17 to 29 with an average age of 23.6. Finally, we had an even split amongst our participants with 50% monogamous and 50% non-monogamous with some diversity in how folks in non-monogamous relationships describe their relationship dynamics in more detail. Uh, and now for the results of our thematic analysis. Um, much of the discussion regarding gender equity in relationships was spoken about in the context of navigating cis-heteropatriarchal societal structures that impact relationship dynamics, regardless of gender and sexual orientation. These discussions both focused on how being trans or non-binary liberated some people from these traditional norms and roles. For example, one participant stated, and I think part of like the joy of being non-binary is like nobody has written the book about what non-binary people should put forward in relationships. So getting to define that I think makes queer relationships that much more like individualized and personal, I'd say. This quote highlights how intimate relationships of queer youth can be a source of power and joy, especially for gender non-conforming young people who in many other settings may feel disempowered or excluded. 
For others, resisting cis heteropatriarchal norms was challenging given how ingrained it is both within us and the society we lived in. As mentioned in this quote by one young trans woman, gender inequities could like creep into relationships where like everyone is a woman or everyone is a man. Sometimes I worry about treating my partner in a way that exemplifies misogyny because I don't think that being a woman makes anyone miso immune to misogyny. The second theme prominent in discussions about what it meant to youth to have gender equity in their relationships was working to dismantle hierarchical power structures by sharing power, responsibilities, labor, and decisions in their relationships. Shared power was often discussed in the context of how partners share everyday responsibilities and labor like chores, but also emotional labor and decision making. For example, when asked about what it looks like to have gender equity in a relationship, one participant stated, if there's a woman in the relationship, she doesn't have to do all the worrying for the cleaning. She doesn't have to ask any of her partners to help clean the house or cook things. Like she doesn't get stuck with the, you know, the jobs that women get stuck with oftentimes. This quote emphasizes the importance of actively working to dismantle power hierarchies by avoiding traditional and stereotypical gender roles and responsibilities. And the third main theme discussed by participants was how relationship equity requires accommodating and affirming each person's unique needs and identities in a relationship. This required accommodation and compromise as mentioned by one non-binary or gender fluid participant in the quote above, as well as gender affirmation and respect, which this young trans woman tr highlights by saying, as a trans person, I think it's important to have someone who affirms your gender because respect is not always sufficient. Yeah, it's kind of like when white people say, I don't see color. It's like when people are like, I don't see you as a trans person. Well, I am a trans person. And so this is a little bit of extra appreciation and affirmation that I think needs to be done. This quote highlights how gender affirmation goes beyond respect and that affirming and acknowledging and appreciating one's gender identity is especially important for trans people in a relationship. So together you can see that our findings really highlight that intimate relationships were a very important source of support and empowerment for our participants. Looking beyond stigma and research over-focused on potential negative outcomes, these results highlight the many ways queer, gender diverse, and non-monogamous youth are exemplifying healthy relationships. This reimagining of relationship dynamics is an opportunity for not only queer and trans youth, but all youth to have more equitable relationships. And I think the findings also highlight the importance um, of, and what we can bring to sexual education to highlight different relationships and different ways that challenge the gender binary, as well as raising awareness for our healthcare providers and folks that work with queer and trans youth to start to work towards addressing their implicit biases around cis heteronormative assumptions about what it means to be in a relationship. So I also just wanna plug before we end that we're currently recruiting for a survey um, where we're trying to create a new inclusive equity, relationship equity scale. Um, so if you are youth 16 to 29 living in British Columbia that's been in a relationship in the last year or is currently in a relationship, um, please help us by filling out our survey. Um, also, if you are connected to youth in British Columbia um, and want to come talk to us, I have some posters and would love some support in, in getting some recruitment um, for, for this study. So thank you all so much uh, for listening today. Uh, I just really wanna thank the CBRC for having us present our work um, to all the young people, uh, to their community partners and to our funders. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Kalisha, Jem, and to all of our presenters this morning. Really, it's been fantastic, and I want to express my gratitude and really acknowledge the incredible work and research that's happening here. We have about 10 minutes left if anybody wants to ask any questions to any of our panelists here today.
<laughs> oh, yeah, I see one back there. I think that mic is on. Hello, uh, my name is Michael. I am from Toronto, Ontario. Um, I'm currently a PhD student in urban health. It's like the, uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University, it's the first program in Canada that I think addresses urban health. So my question is for Kira. Uh, you mentioned that you started a aging out program, I believe, and so I'm looking at the experiences of queer racialized youth who are aging out of social services, so like shelter, housing, and um, drop-in programs that offer like case management and counseling. Uh, I feel like aging out is often overlooked. It's very complex. So I was just wondering, um, I, I don't want to take up like all the time for, because this is a big question, but uh, if you could talk a little bit about what inspired the program and like what that program looks like. Thanks for such a good question. It's really important that we talk about this. Um, I just want to start off by saying that we actually have more children in child welfare than we ever did at the peak of residential schools. So we have an issue. It needs to stop. Um, but right now, our youth in um, our two-spirit youth going into child welfare, many times they don't have space to be themselves. They don't have space to be their queer selves, you know, and. Um, like we've seen in the past for indigenous people, assimilation and cultural genocide is continuing to happen while our kids are placed in these non-indigenous homes and in these group homes where they're not given any type of guidance or the support that they need. And so when they turn 18, they're told, okay, well, now we're done with you. You have not, like, you got this, go ahead. And uh, it's not right, and it's, uh, they, they, they literally are left with nothing. So um, one of our youth, our two-spirit youth we work with, his name was Jay, and he took his own life. And so I worked with uh, Pride Home. It's a queer group home in Saskatoon for three years, and a lot of these youth that aged out, they, they had no community, they had no support, they had nothing. And, so um, a lot of these youth that are in this group um, lived with Jay, you know, uh, shared those same experiences. And um, so they, the youth came up with this um, idea with the name of Jay Dreamers to honor him and um, to raise awareness about suicide. And so it's very new. I started it with um, uh, four other of my coworkers that we worked with at, at Pride Home. And so, um, we just have, so far we've met and we've had good food, we've played some games, we've done crafts, and um, we always open up with smudge and uh, sharing circle, and um, um, we're hoping to do a pipe ceremony to like start it off in a good way. So um, yeah, that's hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. And anyone else in the audience before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you so much for this great session. Um, throughout the session, actually, one of the links that I saw from, with all their uh, presentations was even the fact that often when we think about intersectionality or marginalized social communities, we only focus on um, damage-based narratives, as Eve talks, talks about, right? But even especially the last presentation, what I liked about you, your, what you talked about was the opportunity to queer relationships, to bring, disrupt this kind of the social scripts of sexuality uh, and the stories we tell about what is possible in terms of relationships. Not only focus on the negative aspects, but how about can we expand the menu of options when it comes to relationships, expression, uh, and the positive aspects. Uh, so even when I do work with folks with the, uh, disabilities in the community, we focus so much on the negative, how disability is a negative factor in relationships, how it causes mental, mental health distress, all these things. But I think when we talk to participants, we get these different narratives of how actually it can make relationships better. It can create more intimacy. It creates more conversation, right? Which are things that everyone would benefit from, which I find fascinating. Would either of you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate that. It was more of a comment, but um, 
I think you mentioned that you work with folks with disability and actually one of the findings that's come up in these conversations, which I just want to highlight because we didn't have time to talk about today, was that um, we, we see a lot of folks in our, our studies that also have disability, but that they, they work with their partners and often, especially folks that are in non-monogamous relationships, we see them talking about having multiple partners, you know, that can help support them in different ways and they have different partners that support them in different ways. And so I think that's something that is really strength-based and great and actually one of our team members who's sitting in the audience is gonna be exploring that a little bit more um, in their masters, so very excited about that. Thank you, Kalisha, and thank you to everyone attending this session. I'll ask for one more round of applause for our incredible speakers here this morning.